right. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Scott Brooks. I'm the lead pastor on the preaching team and super grateful to be here uh, with you this morning. I just It's a, such a privilege to to get to bring you God's word and you getting up and making a priority to be here is is seen and known. And, and uh, I, I just come, ex- I hope, hopefully that you've come expectant. Uh, we'll be going into the, the word of God and sometimes you may know these things, but I challenge you is do you know them? And you may be like, I don't know these things, and that's a really good thing. So hopefully the Spirit of God through the Word of God will work in you uh, this morning. If you are new here, you've been coming for a while, we have membership class today at 1145. And so if you're not registered, that's okay. You can come hear more about the Door Church. We talk about our mission, our DNA, our structure. We are one church in two locations. What does that mean? Uh, Man, we'd love for you to come and learn more about the Door Church at 1145. We do have uh, some some, uh, kids care. So you can grab some some brunch and come back if you want to hear more about the Door Church at 1145. Uh, and we have an uh, announcement. Steve Dressler is our executive pastor. He is on sabbatical for six weeks. And so just we're telling you that because, one, uh, being a pastor, there's a lot of wear and tear emotionally, physically, spiritually on on on, on uh, being, being a pastor. And so um, we are grateful that we can send him away uh, for some refreshing uh, with not only with the Lord, with his family. Uh, so you won't be seeing him. So he didn't just go away. He is, uh, we are, we're sitting away for six weeks for just some refreshing. We do that every five years uh, for staff elders, just try to, to keep them from fresh. Would you make it a priority to pray for him? Uh, because, uh, man, we, we want him um, to, to have just a refreshing time. And he has blessed you, whether you know it or not, in so many different ways. <laughs> so uh, be praying for him. We're super grateful that he has that time away with the Lord and uh, his family. So we're going to be continuing on in our sermon series, uh, The Beauty of the Church. The Beauty of the Church is we're looking at. Uh, it, we are the bride of Christ if our faith is in Christ, and it is a beautiful thing. And so we want to highlight what are the different beautiful things that the church actually is according to the Word of God. Even as I was looking at that scripture that's flashing up, man, those are speaking truth that we're a holy nation and that God wants to proclaim, proclaim his excellencies through us. The church, and so like he calls us into things, and so we want to to speak of the beauty that God has designed the church to be. Uh, The first topic we looked at is that we belong to Christ and we belong to one another. We looked at welcoming. The cross is a welcome sign to sinners, which the good news is we're all sinners, and God loves sinners. How do we know that? Jesus sent His Son, and so we want to be a welcoming environment to all peoples uh, of all walks of life because God loves them in Christ. We looked at the glory of the gathering. You and I need to gather and reprioritize our minds, our hearts, our lives under the lordship of Christ, uh, not only weekly, but daily. There's a cadence, there's a rhythm to the Christian life to set our minds uh, on Christ, and that is the focal point uh, of the gathering. And today we're going to be looking at the, the culture of caring. So if you have your Bible, grab it, Galatians 6, the culture of caring. So what is culture? It's an, it's an important question. We're talking about the culture of caring. Um, it's, it's how we behave within an organization. So if, you know the, if you don't know this, the door church um, is organic. Uh, the Spirit of God knits people to Christ, and we become a church family. Um, and there's ways that God has called us as an as a, as a organism to, to behave. Now, the way that that happens in a culture is you have to have a shared belief. So this is why we're going to go to the Word of God. It doesn't matter what I say or anyone else says. We're going to go to the Word of God. This is what we believe. And as we believe the Word of God, it shapes our values, and we're going to communicate and reinforce. I'm about to read about like a 15 scriptures in a row. Why? Because I want to reinforce this is the Word of God shaping culture. And when our minds are changed, as we have this equal understanding and expectations, it will shape our lives, and, and, and we'll start to, to behave a certain way. That's culture. We have, it's a, it starts with the mindsets. We're agreeing upon this is true, and it dictates how we believe. Now, what I want to say, though, is, is you know, culture always eats strategy for lunch, and, and you've heard that saying is you could have good intentions, but if you don't have the right mindset and we don't agree upon what's good, right, and true, uh, I don't care what our strategy is here, it will fail. Because what our mindset is will shape our culture, and that will actually set our trajectory. So a culture of caring is super important for the beauty of the church, but not, not just because I'm saying in the Word of God, but Jesus, Jesus, this is his vision for the church. This is why he came, is that we would we'd be a, a people that, that would embody 
the beauty of Christ, and then we'd love one another in that way. This should be a, what I'd say, a Jesus culture is a culture of caring. In John 13, 34, he actually says this. It says, a new commandment I give to you that you love what? One another. How do, how do we love one another? Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. This is a commandment of Christ. So how are we supposed to, to love one another in this, the churches of people? How are we supposed to love one another as Christ has loved us? What, what a high command. <laughs> you look how, how, how Jesus loved. He pursued, he loved, he died. He, he pursued us when we're at our worst. And he's saying, I, I want you now to love one another that way. So a culture of caring is a Jesus culture. And in Scripture, if you know your Bible, there's lots of one another. This is how you should treat one another. This is a culture of caring. Romans 12, 10, it says this. Love what one another with brotherly affection. That we're family. And we should then outdo one another in showing honor. That we see people, if they belong to Christ, and even image bearers of God, that we want to honor them. We want to pursue them and try to, really, it's a game. How much can we really love on them to show the, the glory of God uh, to others? It goes on to say in Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. So Christ has set us free from the bondage of sin, the entanglement of, of, of really the guilt. Now listen, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to the flesh. Don't just go do what you want. But he tells us what to do. But through love, serve what one another. You've been bought with the price. You belong to God to what? Serve one another. Galatians 6, 2, it says, bear one another's burdens. We'll talk about that more uh, you know, in a second about bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Ephesians 4, 2, it says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, listen, bearing with one another in love. Philippians 2, 3, may the prayer of our lives be like that of Paul that I will mostly, most gladly be spent and be spent uh, for others. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, it says this, therefore encourage one another with these words. So we're supposed to be people of encouragement. That means we're going to get down. We're going to say, hey, God loves you. He sees you. He has a plan for you. He has not forgotten you. We're supposed to speak life over one another. First Thessalonians 5.15, it says, see that no one repays anyone for uh, evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Seek to do good to, to, to one another and to everyone. The, now, the, I just... This is counterculture. If you look, like, look at the world, how we treat each other, it's nothing like this. And that's not the main point. But look at God's vision for the churches in Christ. It looks so much different than the culture of the world, this world. 1 Peter 4, 9 says to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That we should be happy to be, bring people into our lives. That we should open our hearts to other people as God has opened our hearts to us. 1 John 4, 12, and this is the one I wanted to end with. No, Listen. No one has ever seen God. I'm about, I'm about to do something weird. Have you ever seen God? Raise your hand. Yeah. I, I was like, well, if someone did, I'm like, well, I don't know what to do with that. We'll talk later, right? No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, listen, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. W w what's the point there? As we love one another, and we have this culture of caring, you know what's happening? The glories of God is being shown through us. So the world cannot see God. God is spirit. But through us, he is displaying his glories to the world. I mean, that, that literally gives me goosebumps. That we can display the very character and nature of God by how we what, love one another. I mean, people are wanting to experience God. And this vision says he, people can experience God what, through us and the spirit of God in us. So uh, our text this morning, Galatians 6, 1 through 10, <clears throat> I'm going to do a little just context, all right? So Galatians 6, 1, 1 through uh, 10 is this like culture of caring. This is the text we're going to look at about unpacking that in full. Before Galatians 6, there's Galatians 5. And in Galatians 5, verse 22, it says this about the way that we have this engine to have this culture of caring. You just can't do it. You just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to care about people. That will never work. If it does, it'll last for about like, you know, 20 seconds, right? Because you, you just we're so self-focused. We just don't have that ability. <clears throat> the ability comes from the Spirit of God. Verse 22. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Uh, against such things there is no law, and those belong uh, to Christ Jesus. The idea that I want to get into before a culture of caring, this is motivated, empowered by the Spirit of God. We can't do this, but the Spirit of God has to work in us and through us to have this culture uh, of caring. Um, and this is why it says in verse 16 of chapter 5, but I say walk in the Spirit. This is the trajectory of what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. There's lots of people talking about being filled with the Spirit, you know, um, in, in, in churches that, 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 you know, are very Spirit-filled. <laughs> and I'm not laughing. What's interesting, you look at this, it's a culture of caring. The output is a culture of caring. And so, yes, there is extraordinary power in the Holy Spirit, and God can do that. But, but usually, spirit-filled living is not just this miraculous power, but it's faithful Christians living in joyful devotion to Jesus and one another. That's powerful. That's different. Why? Because it's, it's glorifying Christ, not us. And that is a culture uh, of, of caring. So, if you have your Bible, let's look at it. We're going to go Galatians chapter 6, 1 through 10, and I'm just, we're going to unpack it. So there's, there's three elements that we're going to look at. Really, 1 through 6 is we're going to look at this gospel culture, just culture in general. So 1 through 6 just kind of peppers this idea of what it looks like to have a Jesus culture. It's probably not what you think, but we're going to look at it, right? And then 7 through 8, it's really going to look at how do we do this, which I already told you is by the Spirit of God, but it reinforces that in chapter 6. By the Spirit of God, this is how this happens. We have a have to have a tender heart to God, which I have. So we have a culture, we have circumcision, and the last one is just crucifixion. If we're going to live for Christ and have a, 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 a Christ-exalting culture, we're going to have to crucify the flesh. It's not going to be easy, so I just want you to know that. It's not easy. You're not going to get to do what you want, but it's actually going to have to take concentrated effort by the Spirit of God of obedience, uh, which is, 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 is a little bit different. All right, so the first thing we'll look at is culture. Verse 1, it says, Brothers... If anyone is caught in any transgression, you are, uh, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So there's a lot there. The first thing I want to say is brothers. So this is talking to what? The church. So if the church, people that say profess Christ uh, and belong to another. So the people that are brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore. So here's the big idea. We're church family. If you belong to Christ, and we belong to one another, we're church family. So here's what that means. <laughs> I am my brother's keeper, and you are mine. Like, you, you're you supposed to care about me as family. And, and I'm supposed to care about you as family. Not just me and you, but this is how we interact together. So <laughs> when you're like, this is none of your business, and you're part of the church, it is exactly my business. And my life is exactly your business. This is what it means to have... A, 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 a gospel culture. Why? Because we're blood bought. We're bought by the blood of Christ, not only to belong to Christ, but to one another. Now, this takes time, it takes effort, and it talks about some things we're going to talk about. Was it transgression and when to engage when someone is stuck in sin? But we care about we care about one another. You know, you know, you know it says in scripture, God disciplines the ones what? That he loves. That's who he disciplines. So actually, the discipline of God is the kindness of God. So you know who I, who I discipline in my family? <laughs> the ones that I love. I engage my kids in discipline. Know why? Because I love them. Now, if I see some of your kids, I'm probably not going to engage in the same way because there's a different relationship. And you're like, I don't know what you're doing. That's not your kid, right? But in the church family, in the church family, we engage with one another. Why? Because we love each other. We love each other. Did you know, and you've heard the old adage, the, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. To see someone caught in transgression that you, is your family and to turn a blind eye is, is, is the most evil thing you could probably do. Why? Because their trajectory is from, from Christ. They're, they're hell-bent on destroying themselves. You know, I, the Spirit of God has to challenge me here. Know why? I'm selfish. Because as I engage, usually I know, I usually know there's going to be some friction. It just never like, oh, I'm glad you're talking to me about this. It, it, it almost never goes that way. And it's going to take my time. It's going to take my energy. And it's going to take a lot of prayer. And I don't always want to do that. 
but that's what the Spirit of God and the Word of God tells us to do, that we should lean in when we see someone caught in this transgression. This idea of caught is not just like, hey, we're going to be judgmental of anyone that sh- you know, may sin. That's not what we're doing. We're not sin hunters here. We always, we, there's no perfect people. We, always, we usually start with that. We're, conf- <laughs> we're not perfect. We're talking about the trajectory of, of, of sin and struggle that they're usually blind to. So they need, they're caught into it. They don't, it's like they've been drawn up, and they don't know how to get out of it. Uh, they may not even know they're in it. So I wrote down some a few categories here of, of when we should engage. When we see addictions, addictions can, can be substances, right? But we, we care when someone may be engaging in things that are not only harming themselves but others. But it goes way beyond a, a substance abuse. This could be gaming. This could be your social media. This could be this could be your addiction. Could be winning money. Um, it's really anything that you're looking for life and value apart from from God. It could be people pleasing. It could be uh, your your politics. It could be having your own way. You could be addicted to having your own way. Like you need to lose sometimes. It's good. It could be. Um, you know, I was even reading in Isaiah. It could be conspiracies. I mean, I, everyone's telling me what's ever, they send me all these. I'm like, maybe, maybe this is all true. And God's still good in control, amen? So we're going to walk through that even if it's true, right? So we don't have to be addicted to trying to figure everything out. Why? Because God got it. Have we forgotten that? So we got to engage one another when we see them stuck and unable to get out of it. We're starting to spiral out of control. It's like, all right, I'm in or in. Because why? That's not fun. Those are not fun conversations. It's because you love them. It can be unhealthy relationships. If you see someone uh, that has taken the functional place of Christ that's only, you know, in, in someone's relationship, and you just see them being abused or manipulated or, you know, if you just see this destruction in a relationship, it's, it's good to say, hey, hey, this doesn't seem to be going well for you. It's not producing health. Another one that, uh, that it, and what I'm saying, this is not me. I'm one, one of the church. This is us as a church family. Um, if you see someone absent from gatherings or groups, you know, we've already talked about the priority and the glory of the gathering. If someone's continually missing from a gathering or your group or whatever it is, students, something is probably caught in their priori- priority in their life, not Christ. And when something cr- captured the priority in Mainly in their thought, we'll get to when it captures your thought, your mind is going to capture your heart, it's going to capture your life, it's going to capture your character. So it, it is a priority. If you see someone drifting, say, How's things going? Because they're probably struggling with something else taking priority in their life. And I can't tell you how many times I've sent an email as God's put someone on my name, a name on my mind, it's like, Haven't seen you in a while, you okay? And like, and, and they're just drowned. And, and it, so I, God uses you, so when God puts someone on your heart, your mind, man, reach out to them, pray them. I, I've missed you. And they've gone to find another church family say, well, praise God, I'm so glad you're connected, but care enough to let them know that you're, 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 you're missing them. It's an important thing. So we see someone caught in this transgression. This idea of restoration is this idea is like when your shoulder's out of joint, like when your shoulder's out of joint, you're not healthy. There's not good blood flow. You're not doing healthy movements. You're just like dangling, not going well. So the idea is when you see someone caught in transgression, you're trying to put Christ back at the center of the life. That's all we're doing. It's like consider Christ. I'm not trying to fix all the problems. Lord knows I can't do that, neither can you. All you're trying to do is like, man, is Christ your priority right now? I just met with someone who I love, who's, who's, who's part of my family, He's, a, he's an older saint, but he's just struggling. And all I had for him was like, man, have you, put in, have you been putting Christ center of your life? Tell, 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 me, about, tell me about your, 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 your daily reading. Are you in the word of God? And not legalistically, are you considering Christ? And, you know, th- th- that's the hope is we're just trying to put Christ at the center. Because when, when Christ is at the center of your life, everything else starts to, to, to line up. There's health that flows from a priority of Jesus. There's flourishing. And that's, we're just, we're just trying to restore Christ to who he is, who he is. He is Lord. He is Lord. Now, 
we should care enough to, to engage. And that goes into how this should look to a certain degree, uh, a, a culture of caring. It says, you who are spiritual should be restore, uh, restore him in a spirit of, of gentleness. It's saying if you're going to, to go into a, a restorative conversation where someone is caught in transgression, it says it, you should be a spiritual person. This not means a self-righteous person. This means a full of the spirit person. You're loving, you're kind, you're gentle, you're patient. We don't go in and it's like, man, you're stinking. No, you come with humility and say, man, I've been praying for you. It seems like, man, you're struggling here. Have you, have you considered this? No one responds to, <laughs> I'm better than you. That's self-righteous. No one responds better uh, to that. The idea of spirit is, 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 a gent- is gentle and kindness. It's one of Follow me as I follow Christ. That's Paul, as he says, man. I, I, he's like, I, I'm dependent on Christ, and I need him every day, and, and, and so do you. That, that's the gentleness of spirit that we should be going in. There's a gentle strength as you engage someone because you're strong in the Lord, but you're gentle in the Lord at the same time. It's the spirit of God as you enter into these, these conversations. We need each other. We need each other. We're not made for isolation. Um, I talked a little bit last week. It, the, the, the idea of our, our sin is everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Everyone. Did you know that? I don't, it's like Everyone's like, I'm doing what's right. And, and the idea is you don't know what's right. I don't know what's right. The word of God knows what's right. So we come under a community and we're speaking truth and love to one another. That's, that's that idea, that we need one another. So my, the point is you are not dealing in reality in your little in your little sphere of influence apart from a biblical community. It's impossible. <laughs> That's why we come under the word of God in community because it helps set our mind right on, on Christ. Now, let's move to two. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So a part of culture of caring, and I can move fairly quickly, is that we should bear one another's burdens. So a burden is something that's too heavy to care. It's crushing them. It can be anything, it produces anxiety, it can be a sin struggle, but here's the deal, I wrote down here, if you care enough to say some, something to someone about something, you should care enough to stay with them. So if you're going to open your mouth, you, bet, you better stay. Why? That's helping carry their burden. It's not saying, man, it looks like that, that's really crushing you, I'm on my way. No, you say and you pray and you help carry. We're trying to make it lighter. The way, one thing that we can do to help carry one another's burden is it actually says that we can have this, um, this understanding that we're actually going to come under someone's burden, just stand with them. Just have a listening ear lightens. It lightens their load. Like sometimes we're not going to fix things. This is going to be heavy. But when someone shares what's on their heart and their mind and their lives, and they're just li- an empathetic ear, nothing's changed burden-wise besides it's become lighter because they've, they've communicated. Someone understands where they're coming from coming from and it helps helps just stand under that issue and it makes it lighter that's what we're called to do as a church so many of us are carrying so many burns that are crushing us and we need other people to come under and have that listening ear to lighten the load verse three it says this for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing he deceives himself humility should be the culture of any church um Anyone that thinks that he is something when he is nothing deceives himself. I think there's a lot of deception in, in the world and, frankly, the church and probably my own life. <laughs> what it says is, what it, Scott Brooks' translation, you're not a big deal. That's what he just said. Whoever thinks there's something, you're actually nothing. You're not a big deal. Now, in Christ, you're a big deal. In your own efforts, whatever you think you've done, God's, I mean, it's, it's laughable. Like you're just, you're not. In Christ, though, you, 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 are, you, you are special and set apart. There's a humility. See, pride is, is a, I put, a care buster. Like, we're not going to care about other people if we think we figured it out. It's like, the world would be a better place if they just did what I did. No, we're in the business of stooping. <laughs> what, what does that mean? Jesus came down. It says, why we're still sinners, Christ died for us. So when we're stuck in our sins, Christ died for us. That's when God met you. Whether, whatever you think it is, that's when he met you. So what's that mean? We should be in the business of stooping. 
going down, lowering ourselves. Why? Because Christ was lowered for us. Whoever tries to make themselves something is nothing. But the heart of Christ is getting low. He meets the lonely. He, he meets the lonely and the lowly. You know that's the, only God, that's the only place God meets us is when we get rid of ourselves. You have not got, met God until you're lowly. And we represent God when we get low and we meet people in humility. Verse 4 says, But let each one test his own work, and the, uh, then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not his, his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. So this idea is that we are called to carry one another's burden. So get under, understand. And verse 4 and 5, it says, Yet yeah, you are supposed to carry your own load. There's no freeloaders in the church, which sounds so interesting. It's like, when burdens are too heavy, we come under, to, we, we, we stand under, we help carry the burdens. At the same time, God has assigned you to your life and your work. The, the idea of word, there's a backpack, you're supposed to carry it. This is not a licentious for laziness and idleness. God has called you to do your work. And when it becomes a burden, there's people to come around you. In verse 4, it says, don't look at your neighbor. It says, test your own work. This idea is like, just look at your life. You worry about what God's called you to do, not everyone else. That's a good way to carry your own load, right? Concentrate on what God's called you to do. This is, this is a gospel culture. This is a caring culture. A caring culture is actually just playing your part well. Play your part. And then verse 6, uh, just so you know, I didn't write it. It, it, it seems self-motivated, God-motivated. Let, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who, is, who, who teaches. Ge I, I wrote down as generosity is caring. Generosity is caring. <laughs> you, you being fed with the word of God, centered on Christ, Lord willing, you should be generous with, with the local body that, that you're a part of. Um, it says this in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, just for other scriptures. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor especially those who labor in preaching and teaching uh, for the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborers deserve his wages so basically saying take care of the people who take care of you pastor brad the staff lord willen myself our job is to keep our eye on christ and you that's our job and we'll the Bible says that your job is to carry, carry your own load and be generous so we can do our job well. We can't do our job well unless you, you're helping being generous because then we have to work and try to provide. And you want someone who's singly focused on God and trying to shepherd you and it works together. We're a community of caring. I know in the world it doesn't make sense, but this is God's design and you should be a generous person so we can have a culture of caring. It all works together. So one through six is a culture of caring. This is going to take the spirit of God, which is a circumcised heart. Verse six and uh, or seven and eight tells us, this is the motivation, which is back into uh, 522. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one uh, who sows to his flesh will also reap to the fle uh, flesh, reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will uh, will from the Spirit to eternal life. Basically, the idea is we need a circumcised heart to walk by the Spirit of God. If you sow to the Spirit, uh, you, you, it says you'll have eternal life. So we need a personal holiness. This is to have a, a, a culture of caring, we need a personal holiness. We need, we need to be circumcised by the Spirit. We need to be walking by the Spirit of God, sowing the Spirit. So we need to be set apart. So the Spirit of God sets us apart. We belong to Christ. This is our identity. It's not what we achieve, which we receive in Christ. We should set our mind on this, and we set our mind on this, and informs our heart and is the trajectory of our ways. It's his love. So our personal lives, hear me, your personal lives directly impact the relational lives around you. I want you to consider that. Men, your personal holiness affects your spouse and your kids. Your personal holiness, moms, affects your husband. In your kids. Our personal holiness affects our communities. It's no sin is singular. Yes, it's between you and God, but it affects others. I wrote down here, your sin, and the scripture says this, your sin will find you out. And that's not like, there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ, but your sin will prove you out. Not only does it hurt you, it will hurt others. And that's the word of God. And God will not be mocked. This is the reality 
<laughs> of God's design. Now, how are we circumcised by the Spirit of God? Confession. We confess our sin. We, we, confess, we confess our struggles. We confess there are no perfect people in here. I don't know how much we try to say. You and I are not perfect. So that is, that is freedom in Christ to bring that sin into the light. Because when you bring that sin into the light, there's healing, there's freedom, there's accountability. This is a circumcised heart. If you don't know what I'm talking about, in Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. The Spirit of God will circumcise your heart to him. And that, That's a fun word. All that means is like, we don't fall out of love with God. We fall out of repentance. Other things start to take priority in life, which then creates a callous not only to God but to others. So I'm going to let you know a little secret. I, I've had two pedicures, pedicures in my life. That's the feet one. One with my wife because she wanted one. I was like, I'll go with you. And then one with my mom. I think it was for Mother's Day, and I was in high school. And I have, I have gnarly feet. You don't need to see them. Um, but they have calluses on them, and I earn my calluses. I'm thankful for my calluses. And it makes my feet not tender. Well, I went to that pedicure when I was a senior in high school, which, you know, I played a lot of activities. And they, they cleaned them up. And they shaved them up, whatever. <laughs> my, te- my feet were so tender, <laughs> so tender to, to the world around me. When God circumcises our heart, you know what happens when you repent? It's, it's making you more tender to God more tender. You actually, you, you, you feel what he feels. You listen to what he listens to. You'll be more tender to other people. The reason why you don't care is you have a calloused heart, which only, only means that you're not repentant. You're not turning to Christ. When we repent, it's circumcised. It softens your heart to God's love. It softens your heart to love one another. See, it reorients our mind towards Christ and his love for us, and therefore it it will flow out of us. I, I, don't, I only got not too much time, but I'm, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to say this. This is important. Your thoughts, your mind, what you set your mind on, will lead to the actions of your life. So you got to battle your mind. That's why we gather. That's why we talk about the Word of God, namely Jesus Christ. Because if you, you're looking at Christ, you'll act accordingly. You're looking at the world, you'll act, according, act accordingly. And your, your acts will lead to habits, will lead to your character and your destiny. Now the problem here is, A lot of us are battling sin. All of us are battling sin behaviors. The way that we fight sin is not our behavior problems, but our thoughts. See, the reason why you have a behavior problem is because you're not believing the reality of who God is. So you're trying to battle too far down the line that you're not going to have any healing. Because if if God is good and he is in control and he is for you and he's going to provide for you, he is your protector and your provider, Man, you set your mind on that, your, your, your life changes. You'll be a much more gentle and kind and generous, loving human being. Why? Because of Christ. But if you're just trying to be that or stop that struggle, it's not going to work. You can't battle sin with sin. I'm just going to be better. You won't. You won't be better. You need to refocus your mind on Christ and his love. And that will change your acts, which changes your character, changes your destiny. We fight sin by looking at the beauty of Christ. Now, crucifixion, and I'll move very fast through this. It says this in verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. If you, if we do not give up. I just wrote down, we got to crucify ourselves and our flesh. The world is going to sell you a bill of goods. It's all there is. That's not true. It's not true. We live for Christ and his kingdom and his return. You do not judge, you do not judge your life if it's working on snapshots. We know how this ends. We play the movie forward, so to speak. Christ will return. All things made new. We live for that. It says don't give up. It's worth it. It's worth it. So we need to have obedience by the spirit of God in one direction. I'm telling you, it will yield, yield results. It will yield results. Don't give up. By the spirit of God have an obedience to Christ, it will yield the results that you're looking for. Then uh, 610, it just talks about, man, just we should look for opportunities to do good. We should be known for doing good. Where? Where there's an opportunity. That's where we do good. You're like, where do I care? Where there's an opportunity. Open your eyes and open your hearts. Now, I'm going to close with this. How do we do this? Again, it's Hebrews 12, verse 2. It says, looking to Jesus. This is how we do it. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. 
Jesus calls us to have a culture of caring. Why? Because he cared about you. He's the founder and perfecter of our faith. He says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So let me ask you a question. Not a trick question. How much joy was in the cross? You better say zero, right? Like nothing was joyful about the cross. The wrath of God, your sin, shame, guilt. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? Because he knew it was beyond the cross which is glorifying God, the forgiveness of sinners, a new heavens, a new earth. we got to look beyond our temporal circumstance to Christ and the renewal of all things. For the joy set before us, we can endure and love well. Why? Because we know how this thing ends. We know how it ends. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would, by the Spirit of God, this morning, circumcise our hearts, cut away the callousness of our hearts, the hardness of our hearts, that we would confess sin. That we would see your character more clearly through your spirit, through your word, through Jesus. And that we would look to the founder and perfecter of our faith. That he is our example to follow. God, we need your strength. We need a community to remind us to live this life well. God, I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives this morning that that we will be that we have a, a single mindset on you not distracted that we once again once again come to you and set our minds our hearts our lives our families on you we ask this in jesus powerful name amen